Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Sandra Guo. I'm a product manager at uh, Google Cloud. And here with me is Vic Ignatius. Uh, he's our uh, uh, cloud solutions architect. So today, we're going to be um, talking about secure software supply chain on Google uh, for your Kubernetes workload. Um, here is the agenda for this talk. We're going to start with an overview of container security and how supply chain security fits in the bigger picture. Then we'll talk about how supply chain security often looks like, uh, the common pitfalls. And we're going to go over a few best practices to help you navigate the space. Then we're going to go into introduce a few GCP products that's going to help you secure your supply chain. In the end, Vix is going to show us a demo of how the different products and best practices tie together. Let's get started. So um, how is securing a container different from uh, securing a VM? Let's go over a few areas. First, surface of pack. Containers package all the dependencies and application needs um, in, into a, a nice little package so that you don't need as many dependencies, libraries, processes running on the host uh, image to support uh, the containerized applications. This way, you're able to minimize the host OS and reduce your attack surface there. For resource isolation, containers has that built in as well. It uses namespaces and C groups to allocate resources for particular resources, such as um, a storage volume to uh, you know, a, a containerized application or process. Um, for permissions, just like VMs, you want to configure fine-grained permissions with container-based applications as well. But one big difference there is containers encourage microservices. So instead of running one giant monolithic application that has access to everything. Now it's much easier to have smaller applications having smaller access scope as well. So it's much easier to implement a fine-grained access control. And then last but not least, lifecycle. This is probably the biggest difference between containerized applications and VM-based applications. Um, with containers, it's immutable, it encourages fast deployment, um, it's very de developer-friendly, so now we see applications getting released daily uh, versus in the VM-based world, oftentimes a, a monolithic application doesn't get updated for a few months. So with this, and you have, with microservices, you have a lot more um, services to keep track of in the production environment, a lot more deployment to keep track of in the production de development. Um, a lot of people adopt a continuous integration and deployment model to continue pushing out new changes, um, you know, just over time. So for a lot of organizations, the last piece, the lifecycle piece, is where most changes need to happen to the infrastructure, because now you have continuous de deployment, you have to streamline your uh, security uh, checks. And so that's going to be the area of today's focus for this talk. Uh, we're going to share a few um, tools, lessons, uh, container characteristics to help you navigate this migration um, to container-based um, application lifecycle management. So containers has a few characteristics that is going to enable you to have a different security mindset and implement a different types of security model that leads to better security in the long run. Let's go, let's go through them. The first, containers are short-lived and frequently redeployed. This means that you can have one centralized process that apply changes to your production workload, um, and there will be less need for direct access to the running applications to make on-the-fly changes, because making a change through a centralized pipeline is as simple as click of a button. So you would be able to uh, minimize ad hoc changes and have a unified process for apply changes to the production uh, environment. Containers are also immutable. So instead of making one-line changes to a containerized application, you're supposed to, the intention is to make changes to the container as a whole. You change one line of code, you click a button, and it reviews the entire thing and redeploys to production environment. Now you have something brand new running. 
and the Kubernetes infrastructure allows deployment that causes minimum uh, interruption. So you're able to apply changes continuously, you know, no more Saturday 2 a.m. update windows uh, necessary anymore. Containers also enables fast-paced development. This is um, oftentimes the biggest draw to the uh, container format is that developers are able to test out and push out new changes super fast. Um, as the security stakeholders and compliance stakeholders, now uh, every release takes days to complete a, versus it used to take you know, months to complete. So we cannot afford to uh, scrutinize every release anymore, take weeks to examine every component of each release. This means that streamlined security controls are now necessary. It needs to be baked into the automated release process that in your CSD pipeline uh, that gets applied on the fly so that de developers don't have to slow down and wait for the security checks to happen before new changes get applied into production. Um, like the good news is the container format is declarative and expectable. It means that you don't have to run the containers in order to examine the content of it. It allows you to have um, more visibility into the content of a container before you deploy it, before you run it. It also means that you can have much better automation on uh, security controls and scans uh, to automate those type of um, checks as part of your CICD pipeline. Um, however, the, we have here from uh, a number of users that taking care of container security can be manual. For most container users that we talk to, they have adopted continuous integration, continuous deployment, because it's just so developer friendly, you apply changes super quickly. But a lot of them is still stuck in the old security model where deploy controls are applied manually. Um, you know, we have stakeholders basically manually making sure that every uh, release has met all the necessary requirement. It's also ad hoc. The old habit is hard to break. And we um, also see that admins and developers accessing running containers directly and making changes on the fly. And this opens doors to, chat, to changes that are not tracked in a centralized process. And you have, um, you have um, running code that, is, uh, that diverts from its original deploy states and you can't you know, explain or track that using your centralized process and pipeline. And those kind of changes happen at the end of a release. It's a more re reactive model instead of a preventative model. So instead of controlling what gets into production, um, by making those ad hoc manual changes, now you're reacting to bad things that are happening in the production environment in a very manual way. So, um, as, I, as I mentioned, having a CI-CD pipeline does not stop untrusted code from being deployed. Right? You can have a CI-CD pipeline that has scans and analysis enabled and all the goodness, but you can have a privileged attacker, it could be a developer who's making a mistake, it could also be a compromised account that is able to de deploy code directly to production. And now this person is bypassing all the checks that you have. You no longer have total control of what goes into production environment. And on top of that, if you don't lock down your production environment, you have admins and developers and privileged personnel having direct access to the running jobs and now you have another vector of untracked changes to your production environment. And even for those who have a lockdown, uh, have a, a centralized CI/CD, there are many common pitfalls that could happen. Uh, you know, in the developer phase, people could make a mistake. They could check in code that contains vulnerabilities, and their account could be fished, and or they could be a malicious insider. During the CI/CD uh, phase, uh, if you have a one monolithic, super privileged robot account that's running the entire end-to-end CI/CD uh, process, you may experience a confused deputy problem. Your uh, CI/CD pipeline may have a bug in the testing phase and get tricked into you know, reading your uh, source data and pushing uh, random images to your 
uh, image repository. There could be privilege escalation there in the pipeline itself. And in the deploy stage, you could also have trusted account that is able to bypassing the CICD checks. Um, you know, having a CICD, again, does not prevent deploying untrusted code. So what to do? We'll have a few best practices here. Uh, hopefully, that help, can help you navigate around those common pitfalls. First, you should have a centralized lockdown CICD process as a single choke point for applying changes to your production environment. You should build images from only trusted sources. And you should also have streamlined, streamlined scanning and analysis for your images. Last but not least, explicitly verify each of the images that you deploy to your production environment and have that baked in as part of your CI-CD process. I'm going to go through each of the best practices and um, look into details of what exactly A requires. So first, having a centralized lockdown CI-CD pipeline. It is very um, beneficial to have a single process that every changes to your production have to go through. It makes it easier to track changes. It makes it easier to explain to your stakeholders what are the criteria for production release is. We also encourage that uh, you should implement least privilege for each of the release step. For example, the CI portion of the pipeline should have a different permission from the CD portion of the pipeline. So that, that the stage that is able to deploy code to your production environment shouldn't have also have permission to check in code, for example, to your repository or read your source code or check in your source code. Um, don't blindly trust your image repository. Just because an image is checked into your production repository does not mean that it can be safely deployed to your production environment. It could contain vulnerabilities. It could be outdated. It could be from um, something from a year ago. You really want to verify every images you deploy to your production explicitly at the time of the deployment. You should also minimize ad hoc accesses to running containers. So there's no good having a centralized process if people can access the running jobs directly. You, want, you need to lock down the entire process. There are also a few uh, recommended practices that I wouldn't go into details, such as you know, having metadata that you can examine later. And um, you know, just means that it's automated does not mean that human should not be involved. It's always good to have human checks as part of your CICD pipeline. Next lesson, build images from trusted sources. So we know that um, we look at our food, we're like, is this organic? Uh, is this FDA approved? Similarly, when you build your container, you want to make sure you use um, minimum secure base images so that you minimize your attack surface from the beginning. You want to whitelist only trusted code from your repositories or trusted third-party repositories so that you don't have um, random images downloaded from the internet making their way into your production job. You should also be explicit in your step in your Docker file, which means that use explicit version, so not just tags, explicit version, avoid scripting. So when you run a Docker build um, two days from now, it would produce the same thing. When you have a problem, and you are, you're able to go back and examine exactly what was uh, pulled into a container. So to help with that best practice, Google has a managed base image product. It has, um, it's available in a number of common distributions, such as Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS. It's hosted on Cloud Marketplace. These base images are maintained by Google used by Google internally on a number of our infrastructures and products. So keep them up to date. We apply vulnerability scannings to them constantly. Whenever there is uh, available fixes, we apply the latest patch. So if you have continuous integration, uh, new images get built uh, using one of the managed secure base images, you would always pull the most recent up-to-date base images that's managed by us. So it's a very convenient way and, and low effort way to start from a clean slate on your build side. Lesson number three, 
streamlined tests and analysis. So as I mentioned earlier, having a CI CD is great, but it's better if you have scannings or vettings or testings baked into that so that only code that have passed those criteria makes their way into production. So simple things to do are enable image vulnerability scanning and have automated integration test stages in your CSD pipeline. And it's always good to have a QA sign-off, um, which could be a human-involved step, uh, or it could be a manual integration um, uh, gatekeeper. And there are also some open source uh, 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 softwares that we provide to help you implement additional structured test or image diff to further validate the images in your CICD pipeline. So to help with this lesson, we have a container registry vulnerability scanning product that is available today in beta. What it does is every time, so you, when you enable this feature, it um, looks at every single image that you checked into your container registry to look for known vulnerabilities in a number of common base images, Debian, Alpine, Ubuntu. It constantly contacting the, 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 the industry standard um, vulnerability database to pull the most recent vulnerabilities uh, used for analysis. So every time there's a new vulnerability becomes available, it will be taken into consideration for the scans that, that the product performs on your images in the repository. It also plugs into your existing toolchain, so it publishes the result, and then you can use the result for a number of purposes. You can use it to apply deploy time uh, policies, for example, to only deploy things that meets a certain vulnerability requirement. You could use it for human knowledge gathering. You know, if you have a problem and you would like to know what are the vulnerabilities in your running jobs, you could you know, go back and, and, and take a look at the, the scanning results. Last lesson, enforce image deployment policy. So that's what I mentioned earlier. Don't blindly trust your production image repository. Instead, verify every image at the time of deployment. So a couple things to ensure here is making sure that you deploy images that are actually built by you. You don't have a developer down downloading a, a bit minor job from the internet directly and, and, and uh, deploy it to your production environment, for example. And many of us run third-party images, so you want to make sure you have an explicit whitelist for the third-party images that is allowed on your production infrastructure. Um, deploy using digests instead of tags, because digests are content addressable, and uh, you may be able to run, it, it, it doesn't have the risk to run into race conditions, such as the tag gets updated halfway through a deployment rollout. It also makes it easy to examine what happened later on. You deployed something, you want to go back and see exactly what happened. Um, that did, um, uh, deploying in digest makes that much easier. We also recommend that you have deploy policies on a per production environment basis to maximize your flexibility. So you want to have security um, controls for your production environment. You may have very strict rules there that says, you know, only deploy things that is vulnerability free, only deploy things that has QA sign off. But for your dev clusters or for your staging clusters, you may have more lenient policies. You know, as long as it's built by me, I'm okay to deploy it. So it's good to have those type of policies be declared um, at the um, runtime environment level. It's also very convenient to demonstrate um, security controls to stakeholders or um, potentially like comp compliance officers to, to explain to them, here are the criteria that apply to each of my environment and we're able to demonstrate to you in one place in a policy. Um, it's okay to allow human to break this process when there is emergencies, but the trick there is to always log. There is a structure and if humans wants to uh, deploy a quick fix because things are on fire and you know, we really don't have time to run through the entire pipeline, fine. But log that and so that you can review that later. Um, also for vendor images, we recommend that you deploy those directly from Cloud Marketplace so you know that those are authentic images, images coming directly from the vendor. 
So for this lesson, um, we have a binary authorization product that will help with it. It's also currently in beta on GCP. So what binary authorization does is it integrates with different stages in your CI CD pipeline. So as an image passes through each of the stage, it records a signature signifying that the image has passed that particular stage. And by the time the image gets to be deployed to production, binary authorization is integrated to the GKE deployment API to check that does this image have all the required signatures that customer has set in the policy. So this way, even if you have a privileged individual that is trying to bypass your pipeline, even though that he has the permission to deploy to your production environment, he will not be able to because the code that he's deploying does not have the right, the necessary signature on it. And uh, any failed attempt to deploy to a binary authorization enabled cluster gets audit logged. So you can review all the events later on. In addition to signature verification, we also support explicit whitelisting. So your security admin can maintain a centralized third party image whitelist that says, you know, I only trust this version of an NGX, I only trust this version of a, 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 of a Ruby on Rails. And if you have a developer that's trying to either accidentally or you know, maliciously deploy something that is older, outdated, or has vulnerability, he would not be able to because, it's, again, it's not explicitly whitelisted. So I told you about four best practices and a few products to help with this best practice. Best practice. So here is all, it all tied together. You have one centralized pipeline, and you uh, can use a secure minimum base image that feed into your centralized builder. Once your image gets checked into the repository, it gets automatically scanned. And then it gets deployed subject to a deploy policy that you control. If it passes the deploy policy, great. It's a trusted image, it goes to production. If not, untrusted image gets logged into audit log and for future review. And here are the three features on GCP that I told you about that are available for usage now. We'll have a Google managed secure minimal base image uh, that gets updated continuously that you can uh, just directly pull that into your builder. We have a vulnerability scanning that's baked into the Google container registry that happens automatically for every image you check in. We have a binary authorization that enforces deploy policy to your runtime environment to make sure that only images you trust get go in there. And now, Vic will show you how the different pieces tie together in action. All right, let's give it up for Sandra for dropping some knowledge right there. Yes. Thank you. Spectacular. If we could switch over to, all right, so uh, I'm gonna demo a lot of what Sandra talked about as far as best practices uh, through a CI CD uh, pipeline with a sample application. In my case, I have a front end and a back end service that I'm gonna deploy independently into Kubernetes. And it's gonna go through this pipeline very similar to what Sandra just showed. So we're gonna have a developer environment, then we're gonna commit some code that's gonna be picked up by CI. We're gonna create some images and some Kubernetes manifests that are then gonna be deployed by Spinnaker, which is our continuous deployment tool. You'll notice we have two different tools, uh, one and two different identities for our CI and CD here. That's um, lesson number one, centralized, <laughs> lockdown. She, she's got all the policies. She told me how to build this thing. Um, <laughs> so then we're gonna deploy into staging and then have an approval and go into um, production. So uh, as far as the logical view of this CI CD pipeline, where we're gonna bake in some checks is to make sure, you know, after we trigger our commit, that we pass unit tests. So we don't want any code going into production that hasn't passed unit tests. So this is where we're gonna add one of those checkpoints that uh, the binary authorization API lets, uh, lets us add, uh, and we're gonna add that for passing unit tests. Once it's passed unit tests, we're gonna build our container image, push it to container, uh, the, the um, container registry, and in there it's automatically gonna kick off a vulnerability scan. The next thing we're gonna do is add a attestation or a, one of these signatures that says that there were no critical vulnerabilities in that image. Once that's been uh, d uh, detected by Spinnaker, it's gonna deploy it to staging, and we're gonna add another signature there, another attestation that says that we've actually passed through the staging process and somebody has clicked, this is good to go. Uh, and then we're gonna go ahead and deploy into production. Through this demo, we're also gonna try to bypass our security in two ways. 
One is by committing some vulnerable code as a developer. This can happen to anybody. And then the other one is having our, our credentials fished, maybe through some social engineering or something like that, or just you left your laptop open and someone can, can access your credentials. We're going to try to deploy this directly into our production cluster, and we'll see what that looks like. All right, so um, I have a Cloud uh, Shell here. I have my source code available. It's, it's a Golang app. Like I said before, it's got a back end and a front end. And uh, I'm just going to run a, a command called scaffold dev. And that's going to actually build my container, push it to the registry, and then deploy my uh, manifest into my, my uh, GKE cluster that I'm using for development. So here I can see that scaffold has deployed. It's actually doing some port forwarding for me. So I should be able to access it uh, directly from here. Cool. So this is my, my development version. We're going to try to walk through the, the happy path of this CI CD pipeline. So let's say that I'm a developer and I want to change you know, from blue to green because some product manager decided that green is in right now. And so uh, what we're going to notice down here is Scaffold has detected that I've changed my source code, and it's going to do that loop again. It's going to rebuild my code. It's going to push it out an image and then redeploy into my development Kubernetes cluster that's just completed. And now it's going to do the port forwarding again. And we should be able to see our, our changes show up shortly inside of our uh, dev environment. There we go. There we go. Great. So green. Green looks great. Um, let's go ahead and commit this code. Make it green. And push it. And as soon as I push it, it's going to be detected by our CI system. In this case, we're using uh, Cloud Build, which is going to detect uh, a git commit. Let's go, see, go ahead and see if, if that's started. Great. So it detected a change to my backend image. And it started the process. And here, what it's going to do is first build the, the, the container image. It's going to have it locally. And then we're going to start tests. And as we're testing it, it's going to push that image up to um, our, our container registry. When it gets into the container registry, it's automatically going to kick off a vulnerability scan. And in the meantime, we're also going to add our attestation, our signature that says we have passed unit tests if we've gone through these phases. So we can see here uh, the build has completed, or is about to, and then we're going to go ahead and, and uh, push that image. While that's happening, we can go ahead and check out what our binary authorization policies look like. Sandra you know, talked about having policies centralized for various projects and clusters. Um, so here I can define my policy. If we go into the edit pane here, we can see that uh, by default in this project, I allow all images, but then I have cluster-specific rules that I can add. Another thing that I can do is have a dry run mode where I add a pretty enforcing policy, but I don't actually reject them. I just log into, into a stack driver log. So for my production cluster, I have a specific rule here. And that's going to say that uh, I have to have these signatures, these attestations added into uh, my, my image before it can be deployed into this cluster. And that is my production cluster. So I have to make sure that I have my unit tests passed, my vulnerabilities uh, uh, are checked and there are no critical ones, and that I've passed through the staging uh, manual operation. So that's my, my kind of default policy. I can also add exemptions. And one of the exemptions I can do is say, anything that's provided by Google as part of us running your GKE clusters, for example, we're just going to allow. And that's you know, this list of, of images here. But I also added one for a thing that I added to my cluster. In this case, I added Calico. And I want to make sure that Calico can run inside of that cluster. So I, uh, I whitelisted that particular path for images. Let's go ahead and take a look. OK, so, so CI has passed. And now we should be able to go back and check our images. Oops. There we go. So here's my back end image. All right, so it just passed, uh, it uploaded that image and ran the scan, and there was no vulnerability uh, found. In here, Spinnaker has picked up that that image was um, created or it was, was pushed, and it started to check that uh, vulnerability scan result. And this is where you can start to, in automation, uh, interpret the results of a vulnerability scan. It's not necessarily the case that every CVE is a problem for your CI CD process or for your particular application. So you might whitelist some things or, or things like that. In my case, what I do is I set a threshold for the CVSS score that is given to each uh, uh, CVE that's in an image. And if there are any that are above five, I make sure to uh, block the pipeline from running. And we'll see that in a little bit. 
Now that my vulnerability check has passed and I have no vulnerabilities uh, that are over my threshold, which was five, uh, it should be deploying into staging. And I should see staging is now rolling out with the green version. Uh, as, as the release manager and only person, frankly, uh, running this pipeline, I can go ahead and see uh, that I've got my um, manual judgment here. And it gives me links to maybe my metrics dashboard. I'm going to check on you know, some key uh, metrics that uh, I, I need to check for performance, for example, the latency of the application. Uh, I can view the, the sites uh, for, for staging and production. But I'm just going to hit continue because I've already checked that uh, staging looked good and it had the green. And then that's going to add another attestation uh, that I've actually uh, asserted that this, this pipeline can move forward. With that, um, we should have uh, production showing up with green shortly. Now, I wanted to show what would happen if I checked in a vulnerability uh, as a developer. So let's say that you know, in my um, Docker file, I'm using uh, Alpine, which is a pretty minimal image, and that's pretty awesome. But I, I find that I need some new library or something that is not available in the Alpine image. So I want to switch to Ubuntu, and I have an Ubuntu uh, Docker file that I create. I'm using Ubuntu 18.04. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. And I just change that here to uh, Ubuntu, use the Ubuntu one. And that's going to screw me up. Typing on this thing can be difficult. OK, there we go. Ubuntu. Great. So now I want to use that Ubuntu Docker file. I've got my change here. And I'm going to uh, use that Ubuntu and, and push it back through my pipeline. All right. And as I push that, we'll see the same kind of flow kick off. Uh, and we'll notice one main difference when we're checking the vulnerabilities. So again, if I go back here, I should see that cloud build has started, and it's going to build my image. Uh, and then we'll see how uh, Spinnaker reacts differently to that. The other uh, type of uh, uh, compromise that I wanted to show you and how we would block that in our, uh, in our cluster is if my credentials are fished. And I just want uh, you know, to, someone wants to maybe launch a shell into my production cluster. So let's say I go to my production cluster, and I check out what pods I have, which I have access to do. Uh, I have my front end and back end pods in there. But I want to run just a shell using Ubuntu. So I say image Ubuntu 16.04. Great. Uh, and I'm the hacker man. So I'm going to call it hacker man. I just want to get a shell into this cluster and, and poke around a little bit. Uh, so we see here that the deployment was actually created. So that might be unexpected for some folks that are, are familiar with, with Kubernetes. As we refresh here uh, and see the workloads that are in our, our production cluster, you can see here that Hackerman uh, was actually not allowed. While, while the deployment was created, uh, it was actually prevented from creating any pods because it does not have those attestations that we defined in our policy. So now we've sur subverted the, the production cluster attack by ensuring that we have our policies set properly in our project. Let's go check in on our, our cloud build setup here. Looks like things are still building and pushing. Once that's complete, we should see it show up in our um, vulnerability scans here. I'll just go back and check the images. While that image is, is finishing pushing out, we're going to actually look at what, ha what, ha what we can see inside of Stackdriver logging about that event of a user actually trying to hack into our cluster. So in here, I should shortly see that, here we go. So we have a bunch of events that we can use uh, to, to alert maybe off of, off of this uh, that show that someone was trying to run this Ubuntu 16.04 in our production cluster, and they didn't have all of these attestations that we had defined. So you can use this as a way to alert yourself of, of any issues. Over here, we should see the push is complete. And now we have a scan that's started. And I didn't have to do anything other than turn on the vulnerability scan API. And now all of my images are automatically being scanned. Uh, and shortly, I should see a, a nice report telling me all of the scans that are in here. So once that, that's complete, we should get a nice report. And Spinnaker has probably already kicked off and started to check for those vulnerabilities. So it's actually verifying that our, our vulnerabilities are, um, uh, uh, that we have minimal vulnerabilities. So you can see here, it's, it's waiting for the vulnerability scan to complete. Uh, if we refresh, we should have this complete. All right, so now we can see in here a big difference from our Alpine image. Uh, the Ubuntu image has 
a lot more uh, in it. And we can see that there are many uh, CVEs in here, and many of them above my CVSS uh, threshold of five. So Spinnaker should detect that and block this uh, from running. So if I check out the output again, it should have waited for it to complete. It finished, and now it lists out all of the vulnerabilities that I had, and I can see that there are many above 5.0, uh, which was my threshold, and it's blocked my pipeline. So in this uh, demo, you've seen a CI-CD pipeline with uh, various elements uh, using both vulnerability scanning and binary authorization to lock down what can go into a production environment. If we can go uh, back to slides here. Sandra, I think you're... Yep. All right. Yeah, Vic just showed us uh, the, the lessons and tools in action. So what are the takeaways? What are the quick things that you can get started and enable on your pipeline like tonight? Right. First, you can minimize access to your CI-CD pipeline. Get rid of the people that really don't need access to your CI-CD pipeline so that you have uh, a minimum set of people. And, 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 and if you have time, right, separate the um, service account you use for CI from CD so you have some segregation, seg 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 segregation of uh, responsibilities in your pipeline, have minimum, uh, minimal um, permissions set up there but at least minimize the, n the number of people having access to your CI-CD pipeline. Second, if you aren't, have, haven't yet, use a Google managed secure base image in your, as, your, as, your, as your base um, image in your build pipeline. So instead of using you know, Alpine directly or Ubuntu directly, using the Google managed version of it so that it gets automatically updated and patched every time you push something new to production, it's Built using the latest uh, safe version. Turn on GCR vulnerability scanning. This is the easiest one. It's really literally just one click. If you use Google Container Registry, turn it on and see all the scary vulnerabilities start spilling out and telling you to uh, um, of all the bad things that um, are in your image. Now you, at least you have the information to process and potentially act on. Um, last, enforce a builder signature with binary authorization. So this is sort of the, the, the simplest deploy policy that you can have. Make sure that the image you deploy is actually built by you. Um, all right, so here are some additional resources to learn more about the tools and best practices that we talked about today. Um, the slides will be online um, at some point after the presentation, so you don't have to memorize the short links. Um, and here are some additional container security talks and next that you can go check out in the today and the next two days.